Hello and welcome to the next lecture where we will be discussing the revised or the modern square of opposition. Now we know what is the traditional square of opposition and uh, this is what we have discussed until now. So uh, there is a small story again, allow me to tell you. What happened is that Aristotle's uh, ideas were picked up by the medieval logician and they built upon their logic on Aristotle's uh, logic only. And it is called sometimes as Aristotelian logic, sometimes it is called as traditional logic and so on. And there you will find the relations as we discussed in the traditional square of opposition. Now, later on, what happened is that uh, by the mid of the uh, 19th century and uh, the beginning of the 20th century, saw a lot of uh, changes in logic, especially with Booth's contribution, and uh, Frege's logic and so on and uh, the mathematical logic, the symbolic logic came uh, to fore and Aristotle's logic and many of the theories, many of the um, findings of Aristotle's logic were questioned and were also um, supplemented, right? Or they were supplanted by the new understanding. So there was a lot of change in the traditional square of opposition as well. And uh, especially because of the understanding of empty terms, we all know about empty uh, sets, right? Because we have all studied set theory, so we know that uh, every uh, empty set is the subset of every set, right? So we know that and we also know that there can be sets which are empty, right? So given that understanding and th those things which came, so um, this traditional logic went for a change or in fact it was changed and the modern logic came to fore, right? And uh, it took away a lot of things which were available to us uh, uh, from the traditional logic, right? So in this lecture, we will be discussing it from the uh, square of opposition's point of view, right? There are a lot of changes in Aristotle's logic uh, or changes uh, which were suggested by say subsequent uh, logicians and we will be discussing whenever we will be discussing the concerned topic. So right now we are discussing the traditional square of opposition or the square of opposition. So we have already discussed the traditional square of opposition. Now we are coming to the one square of opposition. Now in order to understand that, uh, there are a lot of philosophical concepts like one of the philosophical concepts which uh, or uh, if you see the end of the uh, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, you will find a lot of discussion on a topic called existential import. Now what does existential import means? Existential import says that uh, uh, whenever we are talking about something, whether we are committing ourselves to the existence of the elements with which we are talking about, right? So you will find all these definitions and so on. But uh, I will give you a very basic idea of that. The traditional logicians, the Aristotelian uh, understanding says that existential import lies with uh, affirmative propositions, right? So whenever we are saying all SSP or whenever we are saying some SSP, so these are basically affirmative propositions, right? And uh, the traditional import was there with the affirmative proposition. So we are committed towards the existence of the objects in the subject class. That was the understanding. But when the modern logic came, they said that something can be vacuously true. The universal propositions are vacuously true. Like whenever we say that, say all uh, cats are mammals, so we know that cats exist, right? And uh, these cats uh, are following uh, or they are they fall into the category of mammals, right? But uh, when we say all trespassers will be prosecuted, uh, or all trespassers are prosecuted, it may happen that there is nobody who has trespassed, but still the statement will be true, right? Because if anybody trespasses, then they will definitely be prosecuted. So such kind of things came and uh, there is a good amount of debate on this. So the traditional logicians say that the affirmative propositions have existential import, whereas the modern logicians will say uh, that uh, the particular propositions have existential import. And as we have discussed in the <clears throat> class, which was pertaining to propositional logic, that the uh, particular propositions are also called existential propositions, right? So that is also something which we have discussed. 
So uh, these things have uh, come and there is a big philosophical debate and you can check with hundreds of papers on that and a lot of uh, philosophy books have uh, taken that into consideration. We will be also talking about it when we will be discussing it in the class. But for the time being, allow me to tell you that how this is going to have an impact. I will remove these Boolean representations as well as the Venn uh, Pierce diagrams or Venn Pierce diagrams of the A, E, I and O propositions because this is already we know. So I am removing these but I am keeping the relationships and the propositions here and we will try to build upon the modern square of opposition from here only. So I am removing these things for the time being and uh, I am also not taking the debate of the existential uh, import because that is a better way of getting into that but that is going to be very lengthy and uh, I think that that kind of discussion we can take in the class as well. However, it's going to be very, very philosophical. And I know that since most of you are not from philosophy and uh, are not very much interested in the philosophical debate, let us try to get into the mathematical understanding of it so that it is easier for us to understand. Uh, you still do not know the symbolizations of A, E, I, N, O, how they are symbolized, right? And uh, we will be discussing that when we will be taking the quantification theory after we complete uh, the categorical proposition and the categorical syllogism part, right? Uh, but right now, for the time being, allow me and uh, please believe or have faith in me, whatever I'm going to tell you is the right thing. Uh, the symbolization of a kind of proposition like all S is P is symbolized like for all S, uh, X, right? You can uh, take this symbol as well, but we take this symbol. So for all X, Sx implies Px, right? This is the symbolization for it. Uh, for E kind of proposition, it is symbolized as for all x, Sx implies negation of Px. So this is the symbolization for it. For I kind of proposition, it is there exist x. Now this symbol you know, uh, Sx dot Px. So this is going to be the symbolization of this and here there exists x, sx dot negation of px. So this is the symbolization <coughs> of O proposition. So A proposition is symbolized like this, E, this is I and this is O. So these are basically the symbolizations of it. So um, for the time being, uh, Again, we do not know how to work and believe me, this, uh, this uh, treatment is also found in copy but it is not a very satisfactory one, believe me, because uh, there are certain things which you will find that it is not as per the um, first order uh, logic and uh, there are some problems with first order logic and the explanation which you will find over here. But still, uh, this is how it is given. So, I am also telling you that part of it. Uh, but it is easier for us to understand, right? And uh, for an intermediate class like yours, uh, it is easy for us to understand this explanation and get the point that why the traditional square of opposition do not hold and the modern square of opposition comes out, right? So how we will develop the modern square of opposition. Now, for the time being, I am taking off the uh, quantifier, right? I am taking the quantifier. And I'm keeping it as uh, just the uh, expression which we know, right? So I'm taking the quantifier off from here for the time being because it will not have much of impact uh, in our analysis because we need to understand the basic idea. Now you can see that this is an implication. The universals are expressed in forms of implication. Whereas the particulars are or the existentials are expressed in form of conjunctions, right? Now, suppose if the value of Sx is false, what is going to be the value of the four propositions, right? We do not know the value of Px. We just know that the value of Sx is false. It means that it is empty. This is how the explanation uh, in copy or in many of the books uh, or the mathematical explanation of this is given. So, let us take. Like suppose if Sx is false, so this will be false implies something, 
So false implies something irrespective of whatever the value is, is going to be true. Similar, the value of this is going to be true, right? False dot something, false dot something. We do not know the value of this. So again, false dot, that means conjunction of false dot something is going to be false. Again here, the false dot something will be like this. Now, if you check the uh, square of opposition, what kind of values we have uh, got. We see that A and E can be true together. But in the traditional square of opposition, we say that A and E cannot be true together. The quantity understanding is that they cannot be true together. However, they can be false together. In this case, they are true together. So you can see that this relationship is gone. The relationship of contrary is gone. Right? Okay. Now, let us try to understand here. We know that subquantity says that they cannot be false together. I and O cannot be false together. But again, while putting the value of SX as false, you can see that both of them becomes false. And here you can see that I and O can be false together. So the relationship of subquantity is also one. Right? Okay. Now we also know that uh, as per subaltern relationship, if the superaltern is true, then the subaltern has to be true. But in this case, it is not following. Similarly, we know that if the subaltern is false, then the superaltern has to be false as well. Again, this relationship is not holding. So the relationship of subaltern is gone. The same goes over here. This relationship also does not hold. So now the only relationship which holds is that of contradiction, right? So you can see that the traditional square of opposition uh, changes to the revised or the modern square of opposition. And in fact, it is a misnomer to call it a square of opposition because there are no relationships on these edges, right? So what is left is just a cross of opposition. You can call it a cross, you can call it an X um, thing. And it only says that from the traditional square, when we shift to our modern understanding, Whatever is left is just the relationship of contradiction between A and O and E and I respectively, right? So this is what we call as the modern square of opposition. In modern square of opposition, there are no relationships. There is only one relationship and that relationship is that of contradiction. The rest of the relationships which we talked about, that's it's contrary, subcontrary and subaltern, all of them are gone. Now, this is the understanding of the modern square of opposition, which comes to four when we are studying logic. So, I hope that uh, you followed these uh, two lectures on uh, squares of opposition. The first one was on the traditional square of opposition. The second one is the revised or the modern square of opposition. And whatever doubts you have, whatever uh, queries you have, you can always discuss in the class.